So my name's Lisa Sellen Davis. I wrote a book called Tomboy, The Surprising History and Future of Girls Who Dare to Be Different. Most people are buying the idea that there really is boy stuff and girl stuff from toys to personality traits. When I went to see Girls Leadership, they do this great kind of talk about the pressure for girls. And one of the things that really struck me was that in Legos for girls and boys, the girls' Legos have like a little dog that the girls can take care of, like nurturing's built into that. And I'm like, why don't boys get the dolls or get the you know dogs to nurture or whatever it is? Like, why isn't that taught so soon? Um, and the other piece of that is that the Lego Friends sets don't have don't build the same spatial relation skills that the that the boy Legos do. So they, oh, that's yeah, they're they're not the same kind of Lego sets. They're more like doll houses. There's a few things to put together, but not much. It's a very different toy. Wow. So it's it's really exacerbating those differences, and it's and it's made a ton of money for Lego. It's been very very successful. It's not actually that good for children, and I am just saying, put a boy on the Lego friend box, um, and I think they do have sometimes have girls on the like airplane, you know, helicopter, Eiffel Tower Lego sets, but not. I don't think that often. And my, you know, you are, you are right that girls, toys marketed toward girls tend to develop those nurturing skills and that toys marketed to boys tend to develop these uh, more engineering related skills. And, and so whatever biological differences there may be, and that's up for discussion, <laughs> um, nobody knows because, yeah. because we are not raising them the same so we don't know but we do know that these marketing these toys as being for one group or another really exacerbates those different problem and really every boy should have access to toys that develop nurturing school skills and every girl should have access to toys that develop skills that lead to a good job yes <laughs> <laughs> and there you go the the inspiration of course is my own child's experience and and I, actually both of my children because I have one child who I think is coming in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, have, I have one child who is labeled by other people gender nonconforming. She really doesn't like that term at all. Um, she doesn't care about pronouns. And she, if you think she's a boy, she doesn't care about that either. But the clinical sound of gender nonconforming she does not like that. And um, however, you know, technically it applies to her. And the other one is about as gender conforming as you can get in that she would, she, if, if we allowed her to, she would wear a full face of makeup every day. <laughs> um, and- um, And how, wait, how old is she? She's eight, she's eight. Okay. And she's been like that for a while. and. I, a lot of my research looked at um, why girls often go through this um, kind of tomboy phase around age six, between six and eight, they start saying they hate pink and they don't want to wear dresses. And, um, and you'll notice that very young girls are really, really, most of them into the something like 74% are really into the princess phase and they want to wear dress sparkly pink stuff. And then as they get older, they start rejecting that. And when I found out why they were rejecting that, I, I rejected the rejection. When boys say like, ew, pink is for girls, they're just assuming that being like a girl is a bad thing. And so it's very scary for parents a lot of times when their boys want to do girl things and less so um, depending on how masculine your girl is. And I also am, I additionally am not into the terms masculine and feminine, but they're shorthand. We have yeah, them, I get it. Yeah. use them. But um, anyway, once I, once I understood that many girls, when a girl tells you at age six, seven, eight, I hate pink. 
all they're telling you is I've been taught to, to think that, that anything associated with femininity is bad and I'm prying myself up the ladder by showing you that I reject that. And that's, and that's what you're rejecting. Cause you're like, you should be able to be whatever you want. Right. I mean, I yeah. personally, I, I love many shades of pink, not all of them. And I, <laughs> I really, I really like pink. I love glitter. I love rainbows, unicorns. And you'll also notice that a lot of stuff associated with girls is also associated with like LGBTQ stuff for grownups and it, it becomes reclaimed. But there is no reason when you look at what people reject and say, ew, hearts and rainbows are bad. Just, just take a step back for a minute. <laughs> you guys think hearts and rainbows are bad and glitter? I mean, I just, I know glitter is bad for the environment, but sparkly stuff, you know, I, mean, I love it. Just yeah. really eat it up. So, my boys love it. They love yeah. pink. My younger son has Good. a pink scooter. He wears glitter, like, you know, those glitter shirts with the sequins. They yeah, love yeah. them and wear yeah. them and feel them. Love, love it because it's cool and amazing. Yeah. Right. It's amazing. I love magic sequins. So <laughs> I did, I made a very conscious effort to not participate in the gendering of children's material worlds. I just said, we're not doing it. Pink is for everybody. Unicorns are for everybody. None of this stuff is, is assigned to a particular sex. It's just, it's, ju it's just for everybody. And it doesn't mean anything if you like this or you like that. You know, explore everything, figure out what you like, and don't let anybody tell you that you shouldn't have access to this stuff because of your body parts. I mean, when you, when you pull back and, and, and look at what's happening in those messages, it's kind of ridiculous. Like yeah. you're, you're born with a certain body part, so you can't wear that shirt. I mean, what most of us, as we said earlier, decided to participate in this classification system, which is very new and very restrictive and, and just o overly restrictive, you know? So even in the beginning, childhood, early childhood has only really been gendered in America for the last hundred years. And um, before that, kids had, you know, until they went to school, they were all dressed the same. They all had the same hair. They wore dresses, everybody. It's just a new idea. And, and I think the focus on making, you know, good girls and good boys is, is problematic. I get it. But really, it's about, like, let's make good humans. And in order to do that, um, you know, you have to make boys feel they can access what's on the yeah. girl side. And I think it's a step in it, right? Like, I think ultimately we're probably going to some place where there's no gender and they'll look back on our generation and be like, can you believe, <laughs> right? Like, <similar laughs> maybe. To maybe, I'm hoping. Um, but while the divide is so strong, like, helping bring it closer in some capacity, I feel like is really important. But going back yeah. to you in terms of your experience as a child, did you self-identify as a tomboy? Or you're just talking about your children and that being, when you were talking about the inspiration, I get that you have a child who's gender non-conforming, but I'm curious then what made you want to, I know well, she doesn't, no, like, it, she it. It. doesn't yeah. like that, but it makes, <laughs> Technically. I'm just curious what inspired then to research about tomboys. Well, I was having that experience of very well-meaning people saying, you know, does your child want to identify as a boy? Does, does she want to change in the boys' locker room? And it was all out of kindness and, um, and a version of being accepting and facilitating. And it was a lot of people who had gone to gender workshops that focused really heavily on identity and were generally for older kids, though there are plenty of young trans kids. Um, but I found that after a while, you know, strangers would just assume my kid was a boy and that was fine. And she was treated as, as strangers treat boys, which is quite differently than the way they treat girls generally. And all that was fine. But when it was people who knew her and knew her well, it became this message of like, well, you can't be a girl and be like that. And I just thought, what happened between the 70s when 
all girls, I mean, not all, but many girls, anybody the least bit lefty, they were encouraged um, by their parents and by the culture to be more like boys. What was happening? There were tomboys all over the place, all over the media. What, what had happened that that became a common trope to it was so rare that people went from like trying to get girls to play baseball and all this unisex clothing to you, if you want that stuff, you can't even like identify with the sex you were assigned at birth. Yeah, I wrote this piece about um, the adults in my child's life, the ones who knew her, really, really having a hard time accepting that she was a girl and identified as a girl. And, um, and it was saying like, I totally support trans kids, but I also think when you that there's a kind of pressure being put on her and a message that she's getting that you can't possibly have short hair and wear sweatpants and play with lots of boys and still be a girl. And I was looking at that thorny cultural contradiction through the lens of our own family experience. And, um, you know, writers don't write their own headlines. So the headline was pretty provocative and it said, my daughter is not transgender, she's a tomboy. I sent it to the Times, they took it. Um, and, you know, that headline it was, it, that, that made it tough, coupled with the fact that three or four years before I had written an article for Parenting Magazine that was about her emerging in this non-conforming way and all the stuff it brought up for me about oh i want my child to fit in but i want her to be exceptional you know just all of these stuff that her rejecting femininity was traditional femininity was bringing up for me but that article was never edited and it just parenting magazine shut down and they threw it up on the web and they titled it my daughter wants to be a boy which was not accurate and there was even a line in there that said as she subtly and directly says she wants to be a boy, which is not actually true, but my understanding was so limited at that time right. that, I, that I assumed that if you wanted short hair and sweatpants, it meant you wanted to be a boy. And I hadn't interrogated those ideas in myself at the time. So anyway. That's such a good way of putting it, that we all deserve to be in process about all of this. Like if we have a response to something and don't know what it is, that as time unfolds, we can interrogate it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, but also that headline wasn't accurate either, but the Times headline said, my daughter's not transgender. And the parenting headline said, my daughter wants to be a boy. Right. And many people looked at those two things and thought, this is a woman who is not letting her child transition and is abusing her child. Oh my God. And that narrative kind of played out on Twitter. And that was really frightening for me because I just hadn't, I hadn't experienced that before. And there were threats and you know, I didn't, I didn't like that. No. Um, but I also. I'm sorry. Well, it's, it was a learning experience. Eventually I forced myself to read all of that stuff. And, and there were opposition pieces. And I was really struck by people writing opposition pieces with my name in the headline, none of whom ever called me up to talk. And I always feel like that's more, way more interesting. Like you don't like what I wrote and you want to write something about it, and you want to write about me, call me up first. Yeah. And um, so what I did was I called up some of those people who wrote those things. Okay. And said, and said I would like to get together and have you explain your point of view to me because you obviously have different definitions of the words boy and girl than I do, the word gender, like we're not, we're speaking different languages and you're pissed at me, but I didn't even know your language existed. So can you sit down with me and um, can we, can I try to understand things from your point of view? And it was really those two things that led to the book. It was like, oh, there's a whole movement going on in which words have different meanings and I'm a writer and I'm interested in that. Yeah. And, um, and I'm having this, you know, I'm interested in this cultural evolution and sort of disappearance of this masculine girl 
this model for my child. I mean, she has that model in our family big time. Like we have plenty of butch women in the family and she, and she knows about that. <laughs> and, but until very, very recently, we didn't really have those models in the media. I mean, all of a sudden we have lots of, I, I was trying to write an article about all this like new butch TV. There are all these amazing shows starring. Like what? I don't butch know. Women. Oh, there's a show called Feel Good on Netflix. And there's a show called Work in Progress on Showtime. Fanta about, just totally fantastic. But um, we have some models finally of adult women in the media starting to. But um, I was interested in that disappearance. I was interested in the backlash when I wasn't upset, when I could pull back enough right. to be interested. And I also felt like I didn't like the story ending with a headline that said, my daughter is not transgender because I don't know how she will identify. Right. And I didn't feel comfortable with leaving the story there. What I'm, what I'm actually saying is, so much of childhood has been divided into pink and blue in the last 30 years in an unprecedented way. Right. So much more than it ever was before because it is very, very effective in terms of selling things. That at this point, people, adults especially, but <laughs> and children are now confusing material worlds with gender identity or sexual orientation and that there may be someone assigned female at birth who wants short hair and sweatpants and plays with other boys and is trans and there also may be a, a girl like that who does all the same things and isn't right. and that and that and that putting all this infusing all of these objects with meaning is is a lot is a kind of pressure that makes people feel they these kids feel they can't access this stuff as you say your your boys were teased for liking pink or glitter or nail polish because we gendered those items so i'm simply advocating not gendering the items and um creating more room for exploration and certainly being aware of gender identity and how it develops and making room for trans kids in all of these discussions. And, you know, the, the argument on the other side would be every time you look at a child who's born and, and assign a her, him or her or them a pronoun based on body parts, you're already limiting them and making decisions about them. You're already, you're already telling them who they are supposed to be. And I'm aware of that, but I'm also aware that the, the less their material worlds and their psychic worlds are gendered, the more room they have to explore and gender identity doesn't have to be such a fraught discussion. Right. However they end up identifying, if they want to be like the best humans they can be, that if they feel that they can be strong and independent and nurturing and kind, you know, if they can like Lego friends and the, you know, Lego helicopter sets, that they'll have a greater chance of being a well-rounded person. I was struck when I was doing all this research that I had never read anything about how children develop cognitively to understand gender. And so, I was interested to learn that by age three, most kids really understand gender in terms of stereotypes. And they know boys are like this and girls are like this, and this is a boy color and this is a girl color. And they can't distinguish between gender stereotypes and biology or sex, right? They're, they're not thinking so much about boy bodies and girl bodies, and they're certainly not thinking about gender identity, but they're thinking about if you like this stuff, you must be a girl because it's girl stuff. Right. And kind of fascinatingly, um, some of the psychologists working on this had done some studies where they take a toy that's not clearly assigned a gender, like a silver balloon, 
and they give it to a girl and if she likes it, she'll assume it's a girl toy because I like it, I'm a girl, this must be for girls. So most of them will conform to what they are supposed to like, or they'll make up stories that justify what they like and don't like. So that's why they can't tell the difference between girl stuff and girls. And again, that's why it's important to stop calling it girl stuff or boy stuff. Right. That, that's the first part. The second- Wait, one, one quick question about that. So yeah. are girls more likely to assign the things that they like that are ambiguous to them more than a boy does? Like if there's a silver balloon and she's like, I like this, so it's a girl thing, would a boy do the same? Yes, I think a boy would do the same. It's just okay. the example that the psychologist <clears throat> gave me was a girl. But okay. yes, that's what children would do with a gender neutral object is assume that it's for their biological sex, if you believe that's a thing, um, and <laughs> like because, that. because they like it. Right. And um, then what happens, as I mentioned, is around age six, girls begin to go through this phase of rejecting the femininity that they had worked so hard to master from like age two and a half to, you know, five. And they begin rejecting all this stuff. And at first psychologists thought, oh, that's because they're beginning to understand the difference between um, gender stereotypes and gender or, and or sex. And but, they, but boys weren't doing it. Boys weren't turning six and saying like, oh, well now I can wear a tutu because it, wearing a, it's not what you wear that makes you a boy or girl. You know, generally that's a, a category based on your body. So it's okay for me. That doesn't happen to boys. In fact, many of them become more emphatic about rejecting girl stuff. Okay. So then they had to ask themselves, why do boys, why do girls feel comfortable going over to the blue side and boys don't? You know, they're going through the same kind of cognitive experience. And that is when they realized, oh, this is, you know, around age six, everyone is internalizing this misogyny and realizing that femininity is culturally marked as inferior. When we look at what gets marked as masculine and feminine, you know, the tendency right now, I think we're really, really in a, in a phase where we think biology is destiny to a certain extent, even, even at the same time that people are radically transforming their biology, but right. that, that, and maybe it's not, it's more like, it's not that sex is destiny. It's that gender is destiny, that it's not your body that determines who you are. It's your gender. It's how masculine or feminine you are. And that that has nothing to do with your body, which is definitely true. Um, so I think that I think that we're in it. We're in this phase where we feel like this stuff just happens, and you just are who, who you are, and it's not changeable. Um, but we can ask ourselves, how did certain stuff get on the pink side and the blue side? Because it's changed in different decades, right? And um, you know, all sports were once thought of as for boys and you know then we got title nine and pushed girls into sports and now tons of girls play sports although they drop out the older they get for various reasons right and same still, with stem i read um research about stem how and same with stem considered around like puberty that's when a lot of girls drop out of their interest in right that. right right but we now know that women are not so biologically inferior that they can't participate in the hard sciences, which is what people used to believe, right? So um, once again, I just go back to this, like if we divide less of it into pink and blue, then we don't have to go through that phase of rejecting things because they're feminine. If we stop saying that they're feminine, if we stop saying that, um, and, and we stop equating that, stop saying that feminine is automatically worse. You know? Right, and I think that's what I'm trying to get at. What do you think that at age six, they're picking up on that lets them know that being feminine is bad and inferior and gives you less status? And how has that changed? Because I feel like if that can change somehow, 
I mean, I'm not saying you have to figure it out for me right now, but I'm just saying like if that oh, can shoot. change, I can make a huge shoot. I'm not dealing yeah. with that. I, I guess I don't know what it is in the culture that they're able to discern as their brain develops. You know, there are a lot of studies on how girls and boys are portrayed in, in the media. And um, there's a lot of stuff about, you know, boys tend to use STEM skills to solve problems in shows and girls use magic. You know, they learn very early on that the most important thing about them is how pretty they are. And, you know, we may not be telling them that directly, but there are lots of studies about how parents speak differently to boys and girls. Just, we were, we were on like a bus, you know, the Avis bus from the airport and someone assumed she was a girl and said, let me get that for you, darling. And took the, the um, suitcase from her. Whereas when people thought she was a boy, they'd be like, like, good job. You Good got job that, carrying right? that. Yeah. Um, and it it was really quite shocking to her. It was and fascinating. And fascinating for me to see the research manifesting in my own family of just the assumption that you need help and you know that you need to be, you know, they call boys buddy. They use them by the terms of endearment that treat them as peers versus these objects of affection. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it might not be obvious to us, um, but there are so many studies about, about how the different ways, the different kinds of facial expressions that um, parents use, if there's a girl about to fall off something versus a boy baby, you know, and um, what toys, they've done the experiments where they put a grown up in a room with a baby and they say the baby is a boy and they have all these toys, boys and girls toys and what toys they pick if they think it's a boy baby and what toys they pick if they think it's a girl baby. And then they ask them to, to um, come up with some adjectives to describe this baby. And it's the same baby. <laughs> it's all, it all depends on what sex they Right. What's put the on. Them. Right. And it also um, makes me sad for my sons too, because I, I mean, just my experience as a human, I feel like we can't get through this life without other people. Like we yeah. all help, maybe not with our suitcases, but I want my sons to feel like they can ask for help. I want them yeah. to be offered help and not yeah. have that be a bad thing. Um, and so how, so, so the way that, so you really honed in on this thing that we, we need to remove the negative marker from what's feminine, right? so that they feel like they can access it. And because a lot of the stuff that's marked as feminine is kindness and nurturing and other centeredness. It's, it's really good stuff, but it's best mixed with assertiveness and independence and grit. And it would be better if we could have a, those variety of personality traits and experiences. So how do we do that? I mean, I think the only way to do it is to stop thinking of things as masculine and feminine. Um, I don't quite know how to do that when so many people are navigating the world with those words and ideas as their handrails. You know, that is just like, they've just, that, that's, how they, that's how they get through the world is they think this goes in this side and this goes on this side and this is what makes sense to them even when they're told pink is not a girl's color it's not biological it's so recent you know it's 70 80 years old and it was debated for decades about which which color should go on which side of the line but then they're like yeah but also it is a girl's color now you know <laughs> so, <laughs> you know and um my ideas about how to do that are pretty simple. Like I said, put a boy on the Lego friends box. I mean, a lot of it is about re representation. Yes. Have, have pictures of boys in pink shirts. 
and, um, and really, really, really work on very young children to try to get them to stop policing each other and to stop dividing the world that way. But they need to see models of it. Yeah. And, and it has um, to start really young, for sure. I mean, just because when my son was two, that's when it was, I don't like you when you're crying. Why are you crying? As if that were a bad thing, because that was a girl thing. And, right. you know, my husband had to pull the teacher aside and be like, I've been confused about my feelings my whole life. <laughs> we're trying to raise our child to have a range of feelings. Please don't shut him down, you know, which is hard. Uh, yeah. 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 That's just pure homophobia. So yeah. I was I was not putting your boy in pink because it comes from, you know, the gendering of childhood that, that started a hundred years ago came from an evolving understanding of homosexuality. And at that time it was thought that homosexuality was the result of nurture. And so it went from having like all little boys have long hair and dresses, just like the girls to, oh, from the beginning, let's teach them how to be manly men so that they're not gay. And you know, do you, I know there are lots of homophobes out there. I do not want to have anything to do with that. I do not, when, when the parents are participating in this pink blue divide, they are just participating in, in homophobic tradition. Yes. Homophobic, and, misogyny, all of it. Yes. Yeah. And how it's, to, power, it's powerful stuff. It is. And how to shift that to make people realize it what makes it so scary? Like why? Yeah. Like what would what would happen? Like why is it so scary? The idea that your son might be gay or not? Like what is that? Like I I really I don't understand. You know, and I think that's where I think parents really have to do a lot of the work, like you said, to interrogate belief systems or understandings or even something like a, a lot of people to this day will be like, oh, well, if he's bisexual, it really means he's gay, whereas women can be bisexual and not because there's less stigma. Like there's just, and to kind of just always challenge the thoughts that come up or these blanket statements or, or even challenge other people like for pride. Um, I brought my sons to get like rainbow color nail polish. And when my older son sat down, she looked at him and said, you're a boy, why are you doing this? Meanwhile, right behind her was this huge TV with the pride parade. I was like, you will do his nails. <laughs> <laughs> get it together but so much of you know I don't know as a parent challenging yourself and recognizing your own biases and how that's playing out well and I will say that I have been challenged many times by many people to say who are asking me why are you resistant to the idea of your child being trans and I've had to do that interrogation too like why is it a problem why, why am I doing all this work, you know, so that she can, if she wants to identify as a girl, you know, and I guess I felt like that um, was a good question and a question I've had to ask myself a lot. Um, and I definitely feel like we are having a deeper understanding of gender identity and, um, and at the same time, we are also, we've also never really made allowances for feminine boys. And, and there was a period in the seventies of allowances for masculine girls. But so I'm asking us to do this complicated project that is full of contradictions and, um, and goals that trample on each other, which is to make room for all of these different kinds of kids.